Well, good morning, everyone. We're just uh, going to be starting here in just a couple of minutes. Wanted to come on and just do a quick sound check, make sure everything is up and going. Hope you're doing well, and we'll see you in just a few minutes. So she was woke up out of a dead sleep to a phone call, and it lasted all of about 15 seconds. This is Recruit Daniel. I've made it to Paris Island safe and sound. I'll be contacting you in X amount of days. Love you and thank you for your support. Bye. And that was about all it was. So, but he is doing well um, as best as we know. Uh, it's a, it's going to be a struggle for quite a while, but um, y'all just keep him in your prayers. He's got. This was actually the first week, so he's got 12 weeks left. Um, phase one starts tomorrow. And so he'll actually get all his training. They did mostly vaccinations and all those things this week. So y'all just keep him and the parents in your prayers because we do need it. So y'all stand as we sing this morning.
Uh, glad you could be here, part of uh, this uh, wonderful day of worship. And um, we just want to mention a couple of things here by way of announcement. Um, we are planning a missions trip uh, next summer. We're going to have a meeting this morning, but we're going to postpone that for a few weeks. And, um, but we did go ahead and put the dates, well, let me just mention the dates. They were in last week's bulletin. It's June the 17th through the 24th. So if you're interested, you go ahead and uh, kind of check your calendar out and maybe mark that on there as tentative. But, uh, but it's a wonderful experience. If you've never been on a missions trip, I encourage you that if it, in any way that you could go, then uh, to go. We're going to be going to Honduras again. And uh, it's, a, it's a great, it's a beautiful place, uh, but we had, a, we had a, an amazing time there. We went two years ago, so this will be a three years by the time we go back. And uh, so just keep that in mind. Also, for the Mercy Ministry, if uh, you're a part of that, uh, if you haven't brought your item in today, w- uh, if you could bring that in uh, next week or Wednesday or whenever you have the opportunity. And if you're not part of that ministry and you'd like to be, then uh, see Katrina afterwards. I think we could use... A uh, few more participants. And uh, so let's just uh, continue to uh, pray one for another. We've got a lot of folks that uh, need prayer. And um, certainly pray for our church. And as we pray for this uh, COVID situation as well. As we mentioned in Sunday school, unfortunately, the numbers seem to be kind of going up again. It seems to be a spike. But uh, we, we pray that the Lord will just say this thing and that it'll just be a thing of history. Uh, remind you that if you have an offering, that we have baskets at every door, that you can uh, drop it off on your way out. And I just want to thank you so much for being faithful throughout all of this. Our church has been so faithful to give. It's just, uh, it's just been amazing. And uh, so I thank you for those of you who are listening at home and uh, you've not been able to come to any of the services, but you have been so faithful to give. And we thank you for that. The, and uh, your faithfulness. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day of worship. And I pray, Father, that we would come with the right heart attitude, the right heart attitude, ready to praise you, ready to worship you with all of our mind, our heart, our soul, and our strength. Father, you alone are worthy of our adoration, of our devotion, of our service. Lord, of our praise, of our glory. And we thank you today for being our God. Thank you as we learned in Sunday school that you are not ashamed to call us brethren, your children. And Lord, that we get to call you our Father. And we get to pray and come into your throne of grace. And Lord, as we come today and as we kneel down before you in our hearts and minds and we bring these petitions before you that are so many, Lord, in our church family that is in need of prayer. Lord, is in need of your intervention in their lives that you would just just heal them. Lord, give them strength. We pray, Father, for those who are suffering, that they would suffer no more, that, Lord, you'd come upon them even now and just ease them of the pain of their, not only physical pain, but heart pain of, of sorrow. And, Father, we pray that you would just uh, be with our nation today. Lord, be with our president and our vice president and our governor and our and our mayors all over this all over this land and Lord, we pray that you would just calm the hearts of the people that are causing uh, uprising and rioting and doing uh, harm and damage to to others and to property and Father, we Uh, Pray that you would use this, though, as you are sovereign over all things, that all things work together for your good, that much good will come from this because, because people will turn to you. And, Father, we pray that you would just cause this virus, Lord, to just vanish away and that it would not spread any further. Lord, we just ask this in the name of Jesus and in the power, Lord, of your ability to cause things, Lord, just to disappear. And we pray that for this virus that has plagued not only our nation, not only our state, our city, but all the the world. And that so many have died and so many are suffering today from it. Lord, thank you for protecting us. And we pray that you'll continue to protect our church from it, our churches, 
And Father, we um, just pray that you will bless the service, the, uh, the sermon this morning that you've given to us. Give us strength to deliver it. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us your words. And Lord, bless this singing now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Rob. All right, y'all stay.
Amen. That is uh, good singing today, and always uh, good to be in the house of the Lord and to sing His praises together. Amen. We are in John chapter 5. It's been a few weeks since uh, we've been uh, in our uh, series here uh, of uh, the Gospel of John as we have been preaching through. And uh, we are in chapter 5 today. This is one of the most, perhaps, important sections in the Gospel of John. All of the Bible is important. It's all, it's all um, inspired by the Word of God, but in the person of Jesus Um, This is such an important uh, portion of Scripture. And I want to begin reading this morning in the Gospel of John in verse number 16. And it says, And as, I'm sorry, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh Hitherto and I were, therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making him equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son of Man could do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Father likewise." For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father riseth from the dead, I'm sorry, for as the Father raiseth from the dead, and quickeneth them, even the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto his Son, or unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily I say unto thee, He that beareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but, it is, but is passed from death unto life. Now, this section is Christ's own personal statement of his deity. And that's why I say this is such an important portion of Scripture. Because there are even today theologians who say, or so-called theologians perhaps, that say that Jesus never claimed to be God. That he never claimed divinity. Now, the first part of this portion of Scripture, of this chapter, is Jesus healing the man at the pool of, of, of Bethesda. And uh, this man who had been crippled and lame for 38 years, and Jesus comes on the Sabbath day to heal this man. The first, the the man's healing is for the purpose to lead the man to holiness so that he might be saved. The second main issue in this text is the way the Father and the Son are equal, that when one is acting, the other is acting. With two implications that if you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father. And if we believe the Father, through the word of the Lord Jesus, we have already passed from death unto life, and on the other side, we are on right now the other side of condemnation. What you believe about Jesus is important. As we mentioned this in Sunday school, what comes to mind, what you believe about God, is the most important thing about you. The Jewish leaders had already made up their mind about Jesus by now. When we get to John chapter 5, they have already made up their mind about what they believe or who they believe that Jesus is. He had a prior ministry in Judea. For a better part of a year he was there and he was was ministering. Then he had gone to Galilee where he would be for about 16 months or so. 
And while at some point in his ministry, on, uh, on, on one of those trips, he comes back to Jerusalem, and all the Jewish males, that it was a time that all the Jewish males had to make special feasts. And he comes back, and it's the Sabbath, and he does this wonderful thing. He heals this crippled man who had been lame for 38 years. By now, they have fixed their minds on what they think about Jesus. It comes out in the Gospel of John chapter 8. They call him a Samaritan which was a label that belonged to unfaithful uh, prostates, an outcast. In John chapter 7, they say he's possessed by demons. In John chapter 10, they say that he's insane. In John chapter 8 and verse 41, they say that he's an illegitimate child. In Matthew chapter 12, tells us that finally they declared what he did He did it by the powers of hell, by the power of Satan. Now, of all the miracles that Jesus performed, John Piper says this, none of the physical miracles of Jesus was an end in itself. They all point to something more about him and about his kingdom and about the kingdom of God and about the spiritual and moral transformations that he is working. When he fed the 5,000 from a few loaves of bread and fish, the point was that he himself is the true bread from heaven. In John chapter 6, when he said to the crowd, you are seeking, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves. You ate your bellies full. You miss the spiritual character of the miracle. You only saw the physical. Now, what do people want most in life? What do you want most in life? And what most of us want in life? Probably, probably could boil it down to about three things, right? Number one, we all want physical health. We want to be healthy, and especially if we are sick, we want to be whole. We want ease of life. We do not want to suffer. We don't think we deserve to suffer, and we don't want to suffer. And I can certainly understand that. Who wants to suffer? With people that are suffering, I know people that are suffering. I pray that God would take the suffering away. It's not easy to live that way. It's not easy to live with sickness all the time. Number two, we want prosperity. Why? So that we can feed the flesh. So that we can buy what we want, we can go what we want, we can have the nicest clothes, the nicest homes, the nicest cars, the nicest shoes, the nicest purses, the nicest jewelry, or whatever. So that we can feed and feed and feed and feed the flesh, which never is, which is never filled, by the way. It's never full, no matter how much we feed it. It's like a teenage boy. You know, it's never, never, never full. When our boys were, all three of them were at home, we'd go out to eat, and we'd get home, they'd open the refrigerator, we'd say, hey, we just ate! Yeah, but I didn't get full. (laughs) You know, they're never full. The flesh is that way. It's never satisfied. It always wants more. The third thing is success. Why? So that we can walk around proud of all of our accomplishments. It's all about the physical. So he is saying to the healed man in chapter 5, don't miss what your healing was about. Your healing was about your holiness. I have come for that, so that you may turn to me from your sin. Look at, back up to chapter 14, I'm, I'm, verse number 14. John chapter 5, verse 14. It says, Afterwards Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him. Now, Jesus comes alone, he heals this man, and then he just, and then he just fades away, just without the man even knowing who he was. He doesn't even know that the, 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 uh, Jesus tells him to take up his bed and, and, and to, to walk, and he picks up his mat, 
And the Pharisees on the Sabbath see this man carrying around this mat. They say, hey, you're not allowed to do that. He said, yeah, but a man healed me, and he told me to take it up. And they said, who was that? He said, I don't know. I don't know who he was. And so Jesus seeks this man out in the temple. He comes to him, and it says, He findeth him in the temple, and saith unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. What would the worst thing be? To, be? to be healed of the suffering and then die and go to hell. Die a spiritual death. To be made whole physically, but to die spiritually and go to hell. Now, I don't know whether this man believed the words of Jesus, whether he turned to Jesus or not, but the next verse says, The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. It almost seems like he betrayed Jesus. Now, I don't know if, if that's the case or not, but to go to these Jews who hated Jesus, it seems like he was selling Jesus out. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Let me mention in Sunday school once again that, you know, so many of the people that were healed did not believe in Jesus as their Savior. Now, again, this text is one of the greatest Christological discourses in all of Scripture. Jesus makes five claims about his equality with God. As I said a, a little earlier, there are those who are theologians who say Jesus never claimed it. Claim divinity. There are many religions out there that teach that Jesus is not God, that he's not equal with God, that Jesus never said he was equal with God. But that the, the, the scripture is overwhelming. And the Jews knew what Jesus was saying. That's why they killed him. That's why even before that, they sought to kill him. And at this point, you know, already here in John chapter 5, they're already seeking to kill him. They've already made up their mind who he is, and they want him dead. In spite of all the wonderful things that Jesus is doing, in spite of the fact that he's healing people like this crippled man, over and over and over again, those miracles are multiplied to the people that are being healed. There's all these wonderful things, and yet they want him dead. And he makes five claims about his equality with God. The first one is, he is equal to with God in his person. Verse 17 and 18, it says, But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Now remember that Jesus had told them about the Sabbath, and we could go into a lot of details about this. I think that Jesus did this miracle on the Sabbath to push the issue. He knew what was in the hearts of men. He knew that they were already ready to kill him by this point because they don't believe that he's God. And so he pushes the point here, and he does this miracle on the Sabbath. And he knows this man is going to go to them because he knows the hearts of men. And tell them that it was Jesus who did this, that it was Jesus who did this miracle on the Sabbath, that it was Jesus on the Sabbath who told him to take up his mat and walk and carry it. Now what's interesting is that when they accuse him of making himself equal with God, Jesus lets that stand. He doesn't correct it. And they could see and hear the way he spoke about God as his Father. And evidently there was significant indications in what he said and the way that he said it that they thought, well, hey, you know, this is over the top. I mean, this is it. This, I, mean, I mean, this man is already doing all these miracles. He says he's doing them in the, in the name of God. Now he says he's equal with God. I mean, that's just over the top. The Jews never called God their father. They didn't use that. That, that. They thought that was blasphemy. But Jesus did often. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 36, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not 
Not what I will, but what thou wilt. Paul also used this terminology in Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. He says, For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, what? Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic word used by Jesus and Paul to address God in a relation of personal intimacy which the Jews thought of as blasphemy. That you'd think of God in those terms. That you would call him Abba, Father. This man is really treating himself equal with God in the way that he talks about God. Now what is crucial to see is not only what they would draw that not only that they would draw this conclusion, but that Jesus let that stand. Now you remember in Acts chapter 12, when King Herod comes out and he makes this great speech, and the people bow down and they begin to chant, He is a God! He is a God! And Herod let that stand. And what did God do? God sent worms to eat the man's flesh. He killed him right there. Now, G now God doesn't do that with Jesus who makes himself equal with God. Jesus does not try to correct these Jews in their thinking and what he's saying. He lets us stand. Why? Because he is equal with God. He's equal with God in his person. He's equal with God in his works. Look at verse 19. It says, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that he that, that, that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. He assumed the prerogatives that only belonged to God. Elsewhere, he said, for example, that he exercised sovereign control over people's eternal destiny. He said that he had absolutely authority over the divine law of God. He said that he had power supernaturally to answer prayer. That he had authority to forgive sins. That he absolute power over angels, holy and fallen, that he had power of the kingdom of God, that he declared that he had the right to be honored and glorified and praised and worshipped as God. Now you want to tell me that Jesus never said he was equal with God? That he never claimed divinity? You have to close your eyes and your mind to what is being said by Jesus. Because these prerogatives only belonged to God. Or they belonged to God only. And Jesus let it stand. When they call him, when they say that he says he's equal with God. Now there's several implications of this. The son doesn't, indeed the son can't, go his own way, but stays in perfect step with the father. The second thing is that the father doesn't go his own way, but acts in perfect step with the Son. Now, why is this? Because they can't. They are one. They are one in unity. They are, they are one. They are, they, they are one in person. They cannot go their own way. The Father has to do what the Son does. The Son has to do what the Father does. That's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus does only what the Father does. The Son only does what the Father does. They act in perfect synchronization. Look again at verses 19. Then answered Jesus, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth 
the Son likewise. They are in perfect synchronization in everything that they do. In verse 20, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he doeth, that, he, that, that himself doeth, and that he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. The most important statement is, is the second half of verse 19. But what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Now, there's a different, that's different from saying that Jesus chooses to do some of the things that he sees the Father doing. And only does the, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, he does only what the Father does. It says, what, uh, what, whatever, whatsoever the Father does, Jesus does. When the Father acts, Jesus acts. Now, this is uh, the sort of things that the Jews heard Jesus said, and you could imagine that their heads were about to explode. They could not believe that this man would have the audacity to claim that he was one in power with God. He was one. You talk as if to act, for him to act is for you to act. Is what they would, uh, their response would be to Jesus. As if there's some kind of essential connection or union. Well, there is. In Genesis 1 1, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know where Jesus was? He was right there. Why? Because he's God. In John 1 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? The Word was God. That cannot be any more clear, can it? The same was in the beginning with God, verse 2. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Yes, Jesus is saying, that's exactly what I am saying. That for the Father to act is for me to act. We are, we are, we are one in union. Now, he says at the end there, verse 20, that, hey, you, he's even going to do greater works. What are these greater works? I mean, what could be greater than what he's already been doing, right? And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Well, they're listed in verse 21 and 22, and that brings to the third point. He's equal to God in power and in sovereignty. Verse 21 says, for as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So the first one is power and life and resurrection. The second is the authority of judgment. The, God, the Father grants the Son life. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the what? I am life. I mean, I mean, what greater power is there than to give life? You know, man, with all the technology that we have and all the medical advancements that we have, the one thing that man still cannot do is give life. Doctors have medicines, and we're thankful for that, aren't, they? aren't we? We're thankful for all the medical advancements that they have, but even with all of that, there are times when the doctor will come to the family and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing else we can do. Right? Why? Because they don't have the power of life. Only God has the power of life. And resurrection. He, he brought people back from the dead. People who were already dead, he breathed new life into them. And by the way, salvation is life, right? It's eternal life. As we have, been, as we have learned 
from, uh, from John chapter 3, it is life that comes from above, as Nicodemus says. And by the way, Nicodemus, remember what Nicodemus said when he came to Jesus? He said, no man can do these miracles that thou doest except what? God be with him. And Jesus told Nicodemus, ye must be born again. And Nicodemus begins to question that. And Jesus says, why don't you understand this? I'm talking about life from above. Life from above. That is eternal life. And only God can grant eternal life. He's the only one who can give life. And he's the only one who can give first birth and the second birth. Every birth is a miracle, isn't it? If you ever witness firsthand a child being born, you know, no matter how many times you stand there with amazement of this miracle of life. As you hold that little baby in your arms, we're just overwhelmed, aren't we? With life and the miracle of life. We should be equally, if not even more, overwhelmed with the second birth that is from above. The Father grants the Son to give life. The Father grants the Son to render final judgment. Look again at verse 22. The Father judgeth no man, but he hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Why? Because again, they are one in essence, in every way. Those who, those are marvelous works. And they come together in verse 24 and in verse 29 in the resurrection that Christ produces, and in the subsequent judgment. So the Lord Jesus is one in nature with the Father. He's one in works with the Father. He does exactly what the Father does. This is the vision of Christ that you need to have today. I think sometimes we have pulled him down to nothing more. Many, many have done this. To nothing more than a generous man. Because there are still those who say, well, he never claimed to be divinity, but he was a good man. He was a great teacher. He was a wonderful teacher. Well, that doesn't work, does it? Because he couldn't be a, he couldn't be a good man because he'd have been the greatest liar ever when he said that he was equal with God, when he said that he was God. He would have been a madman. He would have been a false teacher. He could be a great teacher. He's a, he's a liar. He's a false teacher going around claiming to be God, claiming to do these miracles in the name of God. You can't have it both ways. He's either the Son of God, he's either who he said he was, or he's a fake, he's a liar, he's a madman. And of course, we know that he's God. We believe that he's God. And we're not to pull him down in any way from that. The fourth thing, that he is equal with God in judgment. The Father judgeth no man. He hath committed all judgment unto the Son. The Father acts in step. We saw that Jesus acts in step with the Father. Now we see that the Father acts in step with Jesus. When people make of Je- what people make of Jesus decides their final judgment. You know, I just remind you again, it's not about believing that in Jesus. It's not just believing that Jesus was the Son of God. Do you believe it? Is that you believe in grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? As we learned on Wednesday nights in the book of Galatians, there were the Judaizers who said, yes, you must believe in Jesus. You must believe that he's born of a virgin. He must believe that he's the Son of God in the resurrection, all of this. But then they added the works of Moses, the law of Moses. Therefore, canceling out grace, canceling out salvation, Paul said, that's another gospel. When you add anything, to grace. It becomes another gospel. 
It doesn't matter what else you believe. You must believe the right thing about Jesus. You know, and I'm afraid that's what we hear so much today of just, just pray, ask Jesus to be your Savior, and everything, He'll save you and everything. What about, what about repentance? What about making Him your Lord? What about in Christ alone? Not just as Christ a way, but Christ alone. And, and I'm afraid that so many people are getting this false sense of security because they say, well, Jesus, I love you, and Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. Well, yeah, that's a part of it, but that's not all of it. It says, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. It means the Father is in perfect step with the Son's judgment because the one who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. And then finally, he's equal with God in his honor. Verse 23, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. This is the, is the most consequent and yet shocking thing that Jesus now says to them. That he is equal in honor with God the Father. If you don't honor Jesus, you don't honor the Father. You must honor Jesus as much as you honor the Father. To not is not to honor the Father, to do any less then give Jesus all honor and all glory as you would the Father is not to honor the Father. This, again, would have caused their heads if they had not already exploded by now. <laughs> There's a volcano erupting on the inside. This would have been the most shocking thing that Jesus would have said to them that day. And then look what comes after that in verse 25. No, let me, let me back up to uh, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is past from death unto life. Meaning right now, you have already passed. You have already passed from death unto life. And again, this kind of nukes that idea of people with the idea that hope that their good will outweigh their bad and that when they stand before God, that God will look at their goodness and, and, you know, yeah, you, 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 you had some bad things over here, but, man, you did a lot of good, and so, you know what, you pass. And that's the way a lot of people believe. As a matter of fact, that's probably the majority of people who say that they are saved, who say that they believe in God, that's what they believe. I'm talking about what all the false religions teach. But we learned in John chapter 3 that it's not that you will be condemned, but if you don't trust Jesus as your Savior, you are condemned already. It is already, it is already a judgment that is past. The good news is that you can come to Jesus by grace through faith and trust Him as only Savior, as only God, and He will save you. And as he says, he that believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Hath everlasting life. And I love this, again, for those who believe that you, can, that you can be saved and then you can lose your salvation. Well, how is that possible when you've already, you've already, you've already passed? 
from death unto life. You're on the other side of condemnation right now. That's our eternal security, ladies and gentlemen. And I don't know about you, but man, that excites me. Amen? Amen. Maybe you don't believe that. (laughs) I know you do. I certainly hope and pray that you do. We are on the other side of condemnation. We've already passed from death into life. Why? Because we believe everything that Jesus is saying here. We do not question that he is equal with God in power, in sovereignty, in resurrection power, in life-giving power, in life-sustaining power, in honor, and in glory. We believe that, and then most importantly, we receive that. And we trust him as only Savior who died for our sins. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, thank you for this powerful, important portion of Scripture where you lay out so clearly the person of Jesus Christ, where it's absolutely unmistakable that he claims to be God. And he receives worship. And he gives life. And I pray if there's someone here today, and, or maybe someone that's listening, or will listen to this later on, and we're thankful that how these messages have been going out Lord, I I just pray that right now they would bow before you and, Lord, they would confess you as Savior, as the only Redeemer, as the only one who died for our sins, as the only one who was able to die for our sins. And they would pray something like this, Dear God, I know that I am a sinner. I am undeserving of your grace. I'm undeserving of salvation. But I thank you for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus, to die for my sins, who was the only one who could pay the price for my sins. And Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I will serve you. I will honor you. I will worship you. I will live for you. Be my God, be my Savior, my Redeemer. And Jesus, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for saving my soul. And I pray that if you don't know Jesus, that you would pray something like that. Knowing and understanding that he is the only Savior of the world, that there is no other way, that we are not saved by our own good works. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Not of works lest any man should boast. Well, trust Jesus today, if you haven't already. For those of us who are, may we be strengthened in our walk, strengthened in our witness, confirmed in our minds who Jesus really is. And Father, I pray now your blessings On this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, and I just want to give you an opportunity to come just as Katrina plays this morning. If you want to come to the altar, we just give you that opportunity right now. You just leave the place where you're coming, and you can pray. If you want counsel, we'd be be glad to talk with you, either now or afterwards, that you come.
And if you're listening at home, would you just write where you're at? If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, would you right now pray that prayer? Invite Jesus to be your Savior. Ask Him to be your Savior. Would you do that? Our Father God, again, we just thank you for your word today and for the power of it. Thank you for the power of the gospel because it's not by our persuasion. As Paul said, do I persuade men? No. We don't persuade men. It is the power of the word of God. It is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that causes men to turn from their sin And turn to Jesus. We thank you for that. For that is how we were saved. And Lord, we just thank you again that you would just meet with us here today. And Lord, we just pray now all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. And thank you so much for uh, being here today. It was good to see uh, many of you, some of you in Sunday school this morning. And uh, we just remind you that we started our Sunday school back now at 10 a.m. And, uh, and then uh, we look forward to seeing you on uh, Wednesday night, as many of you as can come out and join us at 645. All right, God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.